Well, Erin, I really love to get things done. Me too. I write out my to-do list the night before, and the next day, if I can just crank it out, I'm feeling good. Well, there was this one day, it was just an A-plus day. I was just checking things off, going from one thing to the next. But do you know what I was muttering under my breath? Tell me. I was muttering, I'm a machine, I'm a machine, I'm a machine. I'm a machine! I'm a machine! (laughs) The Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks and got my attention and said to my soul, you are not a machine, you are a human being. Mm. And I needed that dose of perspective. I needed that reorientation because so many times I get consumed with my to-do list and my productivity and I forget what life is really about. It's about the heart, about being a human created in the image of God. Yeah. You know what? I had a friend once say to me years ago, Aaron, you are a machine. And I took that as really high praise. But as you're saying that, I can see that just being a machine that just produces, 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 produces is not who I was made to be. Yeah, and so many times when we're in that mode, you know what we forget to do? Connect with Mm. other people. Welcome to The Deep Well with Erin Davis. It's part of the Revive Our Hearts podcast family. I'm Laura Booz. On this season of The Deep Well, we're talking about a subject we all need help with loneliness. And Aaron's going to challenge those of us who love to get things done. We'll hear why it's so important to value people, not just projects. Here's Aaron. December 17th, 2020, in my life, was awkward text day. I try to end each year by closing relationship accounts. I don't want to take bitterness or hurt or anger or tension with me into a new year, but there always seems to be some, and it needs dealt with. Because we are broken people who live on a broken planet, we will hurt each other, and we will be hurt by each other. It's helped me to stop being surprised by that and to plan for it, which means I send a lot of apology texts. I try to set aside one day every year, usually as the year is winding down, to ask the Lord to help me see where there is strain in my relationships and to poke around a little bit on my own heart and see where there's bruises. Then I take a deep breath and I send a text, usually because I'm kind of a wimp, I send it via text. It goes something like this, is there anything I owe you an apology for? I really want unbroken fellowship with you. I had to send eight of those in 2020. Almost always, the result of those awkward texts is a tender interaction. Usually there's tears. More times than not, I do owe an apology. Sometimes for things I knew I did wrong and sometimes for things I didn't. Sometimes I've said something that hurt somebody I loved. Sometimes I've been dismissive. Sometimes I didn't show up for someone I love when they needed me, and it hurt them. And sometimes I get an apology in return, though I'm never pandering for them when I send those texts. But it's a comfort to hear, I'm sorry, said by someone I love. Bitterness and anger and disappointment, they can kind of pile up in our hearts And it's such a relief to just clear those accounts and have fellowship restored with each other. Now, you've heard me say in this season that I have four boys. You're thinking, man, she talks about her boys a lot. Yeah, I do. They're one of my favorite subjects. And if you know anything about raising boys, you know that dealing with conflict is just part of it, at least in my experience. I'm fond of saying that all of boyhood is just one continuous war game. So my boys will get into a skirmish with each other. And I will say, boys, is this Nerf gun? Is this cookie? Is this whatever, fill in the blank, worth breaking fellowship with your brother? Now, I don't want to paint a picture of myself as some kind of serene peace lover who lives in a home where we're always at peace with each other. Because I've learned these lessons not because my relationships are so smooth. They're not. But because they're so rocky. 
My personality type is like those rams you see on National Geographic that run toward each other head first. They head into the fight. And you might be like me in your temperament being that way. My sister likes to call me scrappy, and I am. Or maybe you're conflict avoidant. Maybe you're like me. You have a big, loud family. Or maybe you live alone. Those kinds of dynamics don't prevent one universal reality. Relationships are messy. Let's head back to the Garden of Eden one more time. We're going to look at Genesis 3, 9 through 13. But the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. If you've been following along with us or you know the first few chapters of your Bible well, you know how we got to this point. God created man and woman without sin in perfect fellowship with him. Satan deceived them. They sinned and the fellowship was fractured. Before sin entered the world, what feels like such a brief moment, our natural bent was to live in harmony with one another. But because sin entered the world, our very nature has changed. And now our bent is to sabotage our relationships, even our most precious relationships. And it doesn't matter what Enneagram number you are, or where you place on the strengths finder. We all tend to blame and quarrel and distance ourselves from others. When Eve ate the fruit that God forbade her to eat, she sealed all of our fates. Relationships would be messy from then on as a result of sin. So how do we respond to the relationship realities of living in a fallen world? That's what determines if loneliness visits for a season, which it sometimes does for all of us, or whether loneliness unpacks its bags and stays and becomes our permanent state of being. Loneliness and sorrow, much like temptation and shame, are often two sides of the same coin. When we're hurting, we often feel the most alone because no one can really grieve for us. I can think back to just a few years ago when Papa, who's the beloved patriarch of our family, went to be with the Lord. And within just a few hours of his passing, we live in a small town and word traveled quickly. Our home was filled. I don't know how they made that food so quickly. We had food and we had paper plates and we had flowers and we had people stopping by to give us hugs. They told us stories, beautiful stories, some of which we'd never heard before of how Papa had impacted their lives. People did press into our grief. And while their presence was a comfort, they couldn't feel our grief for us. And we each had to carry our own heavy burden of hurt. That's a reality of life on a broken planet. And so when pain and sorrow hit us, Most of us tend to hide because hiding seems easier at first than sharing our pain with others because that feels awkward. And can we be honest? It's often disappointing. Even when they give us their best, even when they try to show up for us in their hurt, they can't really say anything that would take the hurt away. And so we can convince ourselves, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to tell anybody what I'm really feeling. But still, even with all of that mess surrounding our relationships, God's Word gives us some very clear instructions. And the instructions are to deal with the sorrows of life together. Let me read us Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. There are many such one another's in Scripture. In an earlier episode of this season, we 
heard James 5.16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Mark 9.50 says, be at peace with one another. John 13.34 says, love one another. Romans 15.7 says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Just that phrase, one another, is a Christian phrase. It's a Christian idea. It speaks to the fact that we are a part of a whole, that we belong to each other, that I belong to you and you belong to me. We're not one and another. We're one another. So what does the Apostle Paul mean when he says that bearing each other's burdens fulfills the law of Christ? Listen to Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 through 40. And he said to them that he here is Jesus You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love God, greatest commandment. Love others, close second. So think back to the Garden of Eden. God didn't let Adam and Eve stay hidden in their sin and shame. Of course he knew where they were. Of course he knew what had just happened. But he comes and finds them. And he compassionately clothes them. How do they respond? They argued and they deflected blame. It was messy. But God chose to enter the mess. Jesus is the ultimate burden bearer. When God's word tells us to bear one another's burdens, this is something that Jesus modeled for us. He took our greatest burden, sin, he carried it all the way to the cross. And when we help carry the pain of others, we imitate him. When we let others into our pain, into our sin, into our mess, we give them the opportunity to imitate Jesus, to be connected, to be really connected. We've got to make peace with messy Sometimes I think the older we get, the less tolerance for messy we tend to have. Several years ago, I was asked to come and serve as a grief counselor at the local high school in my small town. Two girls had been killed in a fatal car accident. And when I stepped through those library doors, the pain was nearly palpable. Teenagers are not very good at hiding their emotions, and I like that about them. I didn't find a circle of high school students crying politely. I found them sobbing loudly. It was very awkward, very uncomfortable to watch. And they didn't want to talk to me. They wanted to be with each other. They passed around their pain in a circle of fellow sufferers. So I just sat back and watched them and prayed for them. And I thought about how God meets us so intimately in our pain. In fact, God doesn't just observe our pain with compassion like I did there. He presses into it. One of my favorite promises in Scripture is Psalm 34, 18, that God is close to the brokenhearted. The more our hearts break the closer he presses in. In Matthew eleven thirty eight, 38, Jesus said, when you're worn out and weighed down, come to me. Don't hide from me. Don't go somewhere else. If you're weary and heavy laden, I want you to come to me. It's a very Christ-like thing to do to move toward each other's messy pain. Tim Cook has been my pastor for as long as I've been a Christian. And for a few years, I served on staff at my church. And Tim would bring us into his office, all the staff members, and he would say this regularly. He would say, guys, you are first responders. When our church hurts this week, I expect you to run into it. And I'll never forget it. I'll never get over it. Because I love Tim so much, and because this idea is backed by Scripture, I I am a first responder. And my flesh instinct is to run away from other people's messes. Always. I haven't gotten over that. But I choose to run in 
to people's messes and to let them run into mine. An aversion to messiness is just one reason we're lonely. Our obsession with convenience is another. As a society, we've worked very, very hard to bypass our need for connection. Our phones know everything, so there's no need to call grandma and ask her for her pie crust recipe, right? We pay at the pump. We buy our groceries from an electronic teller. Fast and easy have become virtues. But what opportunity cost have we paid for all of that? As I read the Gospels, one fact is undeniable to me, and that's that Jesus valued people. In some ways, the Gospels tell one long story of Jesus being stopped and interrupted and inconvenienced. I mean, it's just, this goes from this interruption to this interruption, and he's on his way to this interruption, and he has this interruption. Everywhere he went, people stopped him and asked for sometimes and demanded other times his attention. They were ever seeking to redirect his path. And I struggle to emulate Christ's response to people in this way. I highly value productivity. Part of that's my personality, and I think part of it's just the, the air we breathe. It is a cultural value, productivity. I like to have a plan. I like to know the plan. I like to stick to the plan. And I can get pretty rattled when that doesn't happen. But valuing people is messy. It's very time-consuming. It rarely sticks to a schedule. It's inconvenient. It means doing things that can't be quantified. You can't report to others necessarily all the ways you valued people today. So you can't measure it. So you can't set goals. It means to develop relationships with people based on who they really are, not on who I want them to be. And practically, it means that my house is always dirty because people are always in it. It means that my schedule is constantly being thrown out the window because people rarely have needs in the margin of my day planner. It means that I have to measure success totally differently. And I'm somebody who likes to measure success. I have to measure it by the depth of my relationships, and I can't measure it by a life that feels manageable, and my life almost never feels manageable. Christian community, another buzzword we say a lot. But often when we say Christian community, we're describing something we do. And it's not that. It's something we embrace. True, Christian community, as in communities that emulate Jesus, means that we let our relationships with each other trump neat, tidy, convenient, manageable lives. I, I, I'm not doing all of this well, but I want to. And in this, and in so many things, Jesus, by his life, says, I'll go first. I'll go first. I mean, think about Jesus's community. That was a messy group. I'm so glad the disciples were rascals, because I'm a rascal. But they were rascals. And over time, sometimes over time, history, we polish people up to a high shine. Not those disciples. We read those stories, and we're like, yep, rascals, every one of them. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The sons of Zebedee wanted him to give them power, not his presence. And yet Jesus pursues relationships with these messy people. He goes to them. He woos them. He invites them to follow him. And he embraced the many inconveniences that came with loving such a messy group. I have a couple of sayings that help me live this out. They're not from scripture. They might not even be from me, but they're things I say pretty frequently. The first one I saw on a bumper sticker, and it's this, love people, feed them good food. Love people, feed them good food. If you're in my inner circle and you're listening to this, I hope you can testify to the ministry of my chocolate chip cookies in your life. Because when someone I know faces something messy, it could be grief or it could be stress or it could be loss. I can't fix everything, but I can do something. 
I can love people. I can bring them good food. The other something I have to post often, you'll find it in my office, you'll sometimes find it in my kitchen, because in my flesh, I very often see people as interruptions. And that rattles me. Because people are frequently interrupting me. And so I got to have some strategies to see them as Jesus sees them. So this is a math equation, but even right-brained people like me can handle it. It's people over projects. People over projects. As I've mentioned before, I have four sons. And for them, unjamming their Nerf gun, it's an emergency. And it doesn't matter if I'm in a meeting, and it doesn't matter to them if I have a writing deadline. They don't stick to my schedule. They don't get sick on my schedule. They don't always feel insecure and need their mama on my schedule. And I don't always get this right. And I don't want to claim that I do. But the interruptions of parenthood are just going to keep coming. And the interruptions of friendship are just going to keep coming. And the interruptions of loving messy people and letting them love messy you are just going to keep coming. And I want to be like Jesus. And that means I can't respond with constant exasperation, but with compassion. It means I have to choose that my sons matter more than convenience. They're my mission field. How dare I dismiss them because it wasn't my plan to attend to them in that moment. Every one of those boys bears the image of God. And every person you're going to encounter today bears the image of God. So some questions. Can people just drop by your house? And if they do, can they leave knowing they matter to you? I think of my friend Jenny, one of my closest friends. And we were at a women's event at my church, and we were talking about what would it mean if we were really connected to each other. And Jenny stood up, tears streaming, and said, I want people who will come in my house and open my fridge and see what's in there. And the whole room audibly went, ah, oh, us do. We, we want those kinds of unfiltered relationships. So can people just drop by your house, your desk? And if they do, will they leave knowing they matter to you? Can a friend call you and interrupt your day? Do people say this to you a lot? I know you're busy, but... Or do they have the sense that you are available to them? Can Jesus, by the power of his Holy Spirit, woo you away from your schedule? Can Jesus interrupt you? Can he woo you away from your to-do list? Can he woo you away from your love of convenience to pursue a relationship with you? If we want to be known, two idols must topple. The first is need and tidy. We're going to have to make peace with messy. And the second is convenience. I want to wrap up this episode with one of my favorite stories in Scripture. It's about a woman. The Bible doesn't even tell us her name, but she's a woman who Jesus was willing to be interrupted for. We find her story in Matthew 9, 18 through 22. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned. And seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. Oh, this woman knew loneliness. This woman knew isolation. And she couldn't live like that for another minute. She couldn't stay in that place of disconnection. And to Jesus, she was not an interruption. She bore his image. He bore her burden. She was worth stopping for. Even 
as he was on his way to do the very important work of healing somebody else. People over projects. Love people. Feed him good food. Send the awkward texts. Bake the cookies. Embrace the interruptions. In other words, love God. Love others. And now I have to go have a good cry. <laughs> Aaron, what made you cry? Oh, it's that story of the woman with the issue of blood. And I don't know why. I, I, I'm so drawn to that story. I have been for many years. She suffered for a long time, and so that speaks to being a human. But she had been isolated by her suffering. I think that speaks to the human condition, too. But... I don't know, her need for Jesus and Jesus' compassion to her are so sweet to me. And there's a connection in Scripture that I've made through the years um, that makes the story even sweeter. She reaches toward him, and she says, If I could just touch the hem of his robe, I'll be healed. And there is a verse in Job it's Job twenty six fourteen that tells us that we've only seen the outskirts, the fringes of God's work. And so we're her. I mean, she she just touched the outskirts of what God could do, and it changed everything for her. And we've just seen the outskirts of what God can do and what God will do, and it changes everything for us. And I just am always so moved by realizing that he moves towards us with compassion. I still, after 20 years of being a Christian, I still have this latent fear that my need is disappointing to him Mm. or that he wearies of it. And he doesn't. He didn't with her. And so I hope I never stop crying about it. And I think it does uh, give us a wellspring from which to draw our own compassion for others. Mm-hmm. Because if I'm just going around bearing people's burdens, I get crushed pretty Me too. fast. <laughs> I'm like wiped out within 15 minutes of trying. But if that wellspring is coming from the hem of his garment and mm-hmm. from his attention and turning toward me, which it always is, then um, I can go all day. True compassion toward other people is not to give them more of us because mm-hmm. we're finite. As you said at the top of this episode, we are not machines. Right. But I had a, a wise older woman in my church say to me once, give people to Jesus. It's the safest place for them to be. Yes. And thank so you. that idea that I can love you, I can be in a relationship with you, I can connect with you because I'm really just a conduit to get you to Jesus because that's the <laughs> safest place for you to be. And then it's more sustainable. So the woman, I mean, back to the woman, she she wanted healed and she got healed, but she got Jesus. So she got yeah. more than healed because she got him. And that's a good lens for us to look at others through. You know, we, we have jobs to do. We can't just drop everything all the time on interruptions and, you know, when we're needed. First responders live a certain lifestyle. Right. You know, in real life, people who run to the hurricane and run to the forest fire and um, there's a certain lifestyle they they live and we can't all live that way. Um, some of us have to support those first responders and keep the home fires burning <laughs> right. for when they come back and we rub their feet and unpack their dirty laundry. But when it comes to all of us being a first responder in the in the body of Christ, I think it does look like learning to have some of those tools some of the tools of like, okay, well, the very first thing I've got to do for this person, so I've got 30 seconds right now to send an email back, right? You get an email saying someone has a crisis, um, and, and you you literally can't drop everything right now and sit and talk with them for three hours, right. but you can send an email back. Okay, yeah. what's that email going to say? That's important, right? Yeah. And it's important that an email goes back real quick right? or some kind of touch point as, as soon as you can, but to remember... How can I point them to Jesus right? so that they're in his hands? And then um, I'll look for the opportunity and the door to come back into the story. Even in moments that feel like a really intense crisis that I should drop everything for, 
I'll frequently say, I need to pray about this. My flesh is the first thing on every scene. And I know that my human response is not what you need. You need Jesus working through me. And so just thank you for reaching out. I hear you. This is important to me. But I need to take a little bit of time to pray. And then I'll get back to you. And then I need to get back to them. But that pause, not to be sucked into the eye of the hurricane, so to speak, but to realize, yes, I am going to respond to this, but I want to walk in the spirit. And that requires some time, some thinking, some praying, some watching for what the best responses are. And you're right, first responders live on call all the time, and I don't see a biblical mandate that we're on call all the time. But they're not always at the crisis either. They live they live normal lives in between crises. Mm. So this isn't nonstop crisis response. Mm. But it also isn't the idea that crisis response is always somebody else's job. Right. But that there are times it's my that, job. that we are needed. It's mine, right? Sometimes I think it's helpful to know the costs of my calling up front. You know, when Jesus said, mm. like, consider the cost of taking up my cross and following me so that you know Mm -hmm. what you're getting into. So in your view, what are some of the costs of this type of connection that we are called to as Christians? Well, it can be physically exhausting to be available to people. And usually it's going to cost you some physical rest. And so you got to know there's a, there's probably a physical toll that's going to take place on your body. And there's an emotional toll. I, I don't have very high mercy gifts at all. But we all are gifted with some God-given empathy. And if you're going to choose to enter other people's suffering rather than spectate, rather than just watch or, you know, watch from afar. Or rather than ignore. Yeah, it hurts. Bearing other people's burdens means you're bearing a burden. Weeping with people who weep means you weep. Mm. The Probably the primary opportunity cost is your comfort. Mm. But if anyone has ever been a first responder in your life, mm-hmm. you know it's worth paying. Yes. You know, they've sacrificed their comfort for you. And you can look back on that and go, wow, that saved me. That carried me. I couldn't have gone through it without them. So if you put it all on a scale, it's far more worth it to give to others and to be a first responder to others. It might cost you relationally in other places. I mean, there might be other people who people in your life who don't like that you respond that way or that it makes them uncomfortable or why are you always praying with people or why are you why are we going to this funeral of this person you barely know or, you know, um, you got to be willing to probably not have everybody love it. Uh, This is kind of a theme in my life that relates here somewhat, but. I am constantly convicted that I want to live counterculturally, but I don't want anyone to give me a hard time about it. And by definition, if you live counterculturally, people are going to give you a hard time about it. And if you live like a first responder, if you press into people's pain, if you're willing to sacrifice comfort, that is countercultural and you should not expect it to be widely applauded. Yes. So when it's not easy and when you feel... Like you're at it, you know, you're kind of going against the crowd or going against the flow. You feel that that pressure. Then you can know maybe you're on to something. Right. Instead of feeling discouraged. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've been with us today thinking, yes, I do want to develop stronger relationships. I do want to overcome an addiction to convenience and productivity. I do want to bear other people's burdens. I do want to fulfill the law of Christ. And I want to develop relationships that will sharpen me. Well, Aaron's written a book that will help you seek God's word and explore the topic of relationships. It's called Connected, Curing the Pandemic of Everyone Feeling Alone Together. It's full of really helpful insights that will get you out of the status quo and start you living your relationships the way God intended. To get a copy for yourself or a small group, you can visit reviveourhearts.com slash the deep well. On the next episode, Erin is going to explore a paradox. Sometimes when we're the most lonely, we don't actually need to be around other people. We need something far more important. Next time on the deep well, Erin will show us what we do need. 
We'll open the Bible together next time with Aaron because God's word is a deep well. You can drop down your bucket and pull up truth every time. The Deep Well is a production of Revive Our Hearts, calling women to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.